Welcome to Scottish Watch's podcast. This is the episode where we have all the chats, all the talks, all the interviews with the brands that came along to British Watchmakers Day. It is phenomenal. You will love it. There are so many cool people, products to talk about, special edition, new releases. We couldn't cram everybody that was at the show along, but we did catch up with some of our friends, some of the brands that worked with us in the past, who have sent us watches to review, and they've got a lot of great stories to tell. So without further ado, let's get into it. So here we are at Watchmakers Day with Johnny from William Wood. He was recently on the show, giving you a quick explanation of a watch that he's got in wrist so you can actually see the thing live instead of renders, instead of pictures. But we're in setup day, it's a little bit noisy, but we're quickly going to grab maybe five minutes with you just for a quick catch up about the stuff that you didn't talk about on the show. So what are you expecting from today? What are your aspirations for Watchmakers Day and what are you bringing along apart from this little guy here? Well, uh, aspirations from today is going to be setting up this stand, so we're excited to get it all set up. We actually have a new stand, a whole new variation and design that people are going to be able to see, which is cool. Uh, so tomorrow, the biggie is going to be the fire exit watch. I really think that people are going to be coming uh, in their droves to get, get hands on with it, see the design, play with the disc in the back of the watch. Um, it's, it's a really fun, really creative watch. And already on social media, we've had such an amazing response. So I think tomorrow is going to be really exciting, Ricky. Well, I've seen some of the comments and I've heard people talking about the watch and comment to me about the little insert we put in our podcast a week ago. And I think this one's caught the attention in a completely different way. I don't know why. I don't know if it's maybe because it's so green. You've done your purples, you've done your oranges, you've even done the blacked ones maybe a year or two ago. And then the original, the Valiants and all the rest of it. What do you think's been the changes that maybe you've got a new designer that's injecting some new ideas? Exactly. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Ricky. So this year we've uh, we've uh, collaborated with a watch designer called Max Resnick. He's an award-winning British watch designer to really bring to life a fire exit sign into a living, uh, I guess, organism of a day-to-day watch. Uh, it was a really fun experience for, for us to bounce ideas off each other. And I think now when you look at this watch and the next watch that we have coming out, Listeners and everybody uh, who's paying attention will be able to see that we're really starting to level up our design game. So I'd say that's probably a, a big reason why. We're, we're leaning on some industry-leading expertise now. And we're not exactly in May yet, and you did hint towards some things happening. Can you give us any kind of clue as to what's next? For sure, yeah. So uh, May, not to, um, to play it down, we are basically releasing the most important watch of our company's history, okay? So we've been trading for seven years now. Uh, This watch here is in collaboration with a London Fire Brigade fireboat that saved over 600 lives off the beaches of Dunkirk. We're going to be taking original pieces from the boat, the original engine parts from the 1940s, and putting it inside of the watch. Anybody who purchases the watch will physically have their name engraved onto a plaque that goes on the boat and sails over the channel for the 80th year anniversary of World War II ending. So it's it's a pretty magnificent watch. Um, Can't say too much more about it than that for now, but you'll start to see the marketing uh, ramping up from April onwards. We know you've got to set your stand up. We've seen how big it's going to be. It's going to take you a little bit of time. Yes. But yeah, it's good having you on the show, maybe a couple of weeks in a row. Yes, yeah. Appreciate it, Ricky, as ever. No worries. We'll see you soon. Thank you. And it is Andrew from Zero West. Great to be here. It's amazing. I never thought this would be quite as big, quite as bold, and quite as beautiful as it is. And I've seen some of the special edition watches. I've not seen yours yet, but we have seen Johnny at William Wood. We've seen some of the Fear stuff. We have a sneaky peek of bits and bobs, but you can tell us what you're bringing to the table yeah. today. We've, we've got two custom specials. Uh, we've got, based on our really popular uh, locomotive range and pilot watch range, we've got a DB80 Blackout. It's a one of one. Uh, we produced 50... 50 DB80s originally, and this one, which was all in a brushed, uh, sandblasted case, uh, this one is in a blackout case. Can we pretend that we don't know what DB80 is? Sorry. Of course. Yeah, DB80 was the range that we did, our, our Lancaster. It commemorated Operation Chastise. And what makes this watch really unique is it has a piece of uh, metal from the bodywork of one of the Lancasters that flew on the Dam Buster mission. Uh, it took us over a year and a half to obtain this material. We only had a small amount and we created the back of the watch with a uh, special back with a sapphire crystal that houses this metal that you can see. So it's really historically significant. And the front of the dial is based on an outer meter gauge from a Lancaster bomber. So really, really unique piece. We've never done one in black. Uh, it looks super stealthy and um, we've had a lot of interest. And I think one of the hardest problems we've had is uh, we've had lots of customers who have wanted to buy it prior to the show. But it's all about coming to the show, 
I had, I had one customer who's told, uh, he's already booked a hotel ages ago and he's uh, going to be banging on the door first thing tomorrow. So first world problems. We have heard this. We've seen so many people posting that they wanted to come along and they haven't. Yeah. We've been banging the drum for what, three months about yeah, yeah. buy your tickets. Yeah. People don't listen to us. What can we do? You know, we do our best. Uh, what else has been happening then? Because it's been a while since you've been on the show. Give us a quick sort of couple of minutes. Yeah, What's uh, been happening the last couple of years? Yeah, loads of exciting stuff. Uh, we're holding lots of regular events at our design studio down in Emsworth. Uh, we have lots of car clubs that come on alternate Saturdays. We do put on all breakfast and it's a great vibe. You know, cars and watches go together. Uh, so that's been fantastic. We've been working on some great models for this year. Uh, we spent a lot of last year working on them. Everything takes a lot longer than, than you want. We're a very small team. But Graham, my business partner, ex-military engineer. Is he here? He is here. Am I going to get to see what he looks like? going to get to see what he looks like. First <sighs> time ever. You just hired somebody for the day, haven't you? <laughs> somebody joked about that somebody last dressed week. up as an Oompa Loompa. <laughs> but he is here. And uh, yeah, I'll introduce you to him later. So yeah, some really exciting stuff this year. Uh, like everything, we, all, we, we were hoping that we would have a watch, uh, a brand, brand new watch for the show, but we changed some bits and, it, and it's pushed on a little bit. But it, it's fantastic to be here, especially with all these other brands. And um, yeah, we, I mean, we heard about the show like you probably last summer. And uh, we've just been counting down the days. And the, the moment you walk in, everybody's in for a fantastic treat tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be something special. And obviously, by the time you hear and see this, the show will be a distant memory, yeah. but the legend will live on. Absolutely. So thank you very much for joining well, us today. Your time, Ricky. And we'll catch you tomorrow. Yeah, look forward to it. Do you want to introduce yourself on video to the audience? Sure, yeah. I'm Simon Jeffs, MD of Brooklyn's Watch Company. Pleased to be here. That was quite quick. I remember the first time we had an interview and asked a question, it was like military answers. So we're going to try and spread this out, maybe spend a couple of minutes talking about why you're at the show, what you're going to be showing off, and what your expectations are going to be of the first inaugural British Watchmakers Day. Okay, so we're here today really to showcase the brand. Um, we're a new brand. Um, people are just starting to get to know us. Um, we only have uh, one product, uh, which is a racing chronograph designed by Sir Terence Conran. But we have a special here today of a limited run of just three watches for Watchmakers Day only. Um, and we're very excited about that, see how that's received. And what are the differences with the special edition versus the normal one? So the special edition is in um, the Alliance colors. So it's a, a royal blue face. Um, we, we keep our red second hand, which matches nicely. And the, it has a bespoke case back. Again, quite quick answer. So we're going to try and tease a little bit more information okay. out of you. Yep. When you're on the show, I've spoken to you about this before. I did mention it as well on a prior episode that came out after that, that people not only loved the fact that you were building a watch, that you've got a background in aerospace and all that kind of stuff, but you've got these tie-ins with land speed records, very famous individuals, and the fact that you were talking about Concord, and we're working on something in the background that maybe we can get sorted out within the next month or two. So all the people that are listening and watching, they're into airplanes and all that kind of stuff. If you got in touch and you asked to have this guy back on to talk more about flight and things in the air, don't worry, we have got something coming soon. But what's coming later in the year? Have you got any plans? Is there going to be so many moves, new designs, prototypes, new releases? So yeah, um, the next thing up is a chef's case back. What's that? So um, Sir Terence, uh, owned Michelin House, and in, under his ownership, he restored all the stained glass windows. And it's an absolutely beautiful building that was built in 1911. And um, Michelin built it as a grand statement for their arrival in the UK to sell tires. Okay. Um, customers used to drive into the building in their cars, um, and while their tires were being changed, they would ask them into the touring office. And in the touring office, they gave them a Michelin guide. And it was basically a book to show them all the routes around the UK that Michelin thought were good. And basically they wanted their customers to wear their tires out so they could sell them more. Um, but from that came ratings of restaurants. And I think that came later in the 20s. So the first UK Michelin guide was issued in 1911 from Michelin House. And we felt there are a few Michelin star chefs who have our watch and we wanted to have a particularly uh, special version for them. So we produced a case back with their name on and a feature that references Michelin house. And also it's set with sapphires, depending on how many 
Michelin stars they've won. That is a great idea. And again, another story that we didn't know about. I mean, some of the stuff you were talking about, we're running out of time, I'm going to be quick. Some of the stuff you're chatting about in our episode, which I tell people to go and check out, you're talking about timing equipment down to a thousandth of a second in racetracks nearly 100 years ago. Concord, Michelin stories. I think next time you're on the show, we're going to have a great time talking and delving into other areas, perhaps more than what we've done in the past, more than just watchmaking. Because what we find in the show is people love cars, motorcycles, camera equipment, and I think uh, you've got quite a few tales to tell. So uh, you should be back on sooner rather than later. You up for that? I look forward to it. Yeah, Excellent. good fun. Well, have a great show and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Ricky. So it turns out I'd never met Neil from Duckworth before, but I met him today and it felt like an old friend, an old family member. And there's somebody that he used to work for him. Hey, Roger. How Roger, are you doing? come say hello. Good to see you, mate. And you? How are you? Very, very good yeah, to see you. Good. Come on in here. Who would have thought? <laughs> oh, oh. That's that's really oh my God, are you drunk already? These years later, two boys from Bolton <laughs> will be at the same bloody place. It's oh amazing, God, isn't it? Well, Roger is here, but he is not the star of this <laughs> little part of the episode. So you're going to come back later on Absolutely. and we're going to grab you. But you're, you're going to leave this place so you don't break anything. Don't, don't yes. All right, nice We'll see catch you soon, Roger. Guys. <laughs> we'll have some pies ready for you. Yeah. Some pasties. <laughs> right, you, well, that was Roger Smith, uh, ex-employee of Neil from Duckworth Prestex. And yeah, it feels like I've known you for so long. Indeed. You've been involved, you've been on the show maybe three or four times, little inserts, full episodes, bringing us up to speed on things. There's been various parts of the shows we've had to delete because your Whoops. mouth runs away with itself. But I'm pretty sure today and tomorrow, actually, the actual event itself, your mouth can run away with itself because people are wanting to find out about what you're up to, the new releases, if you promise never to do a watch and then decide to release one because that has happened as well. It so has. what is your take on British Watchmakers Day? This seems to be something that should have happened a long time ago. This is the inaugural event. What are you bringing to the table, literally, round the corner? It's long overdue. It's, uh, I think it's been five years in the making since uh, Mike France and Roger Smith got together uh, and decided that this was a thing to do. For the British watch industry, uh, as I say, it's, it's a long time overdue and, and it's very welcome. And what, uh, what a place they've chosen and what a venue and what a day it's going to be. So what are you bringing along? We've seen some of the releases, we see what's on the wrist. You don't have any stock today on setup day, but tomorrow you'll have everything on the table. What's new? Yeah, I've got uh, all my watches coming tomorrow. Nothing today apart from my uh, uh, Rivington GMT Orange. But what is new? Tomorrow I'll have the whole collection with me. I will also have uh, a handful of the 18 karat gold commemoration watches, which are our centenary uh, models. Uh, but most importantly, I will have 10 unique watches, which I've made for the day, along with various other brands who've also made special pieces, which I call the number one. And there are 10 pieces, uh, one in each different color, and they'll be for, they'll be for sale on the day tomorrow. The difference with this watch is it will have British watch and clockmakers around the dial instead of numerals. That's something a little bit different. And what is your biggest seller? What is the one that people gravitate towards? That's an ever moving feast, actually. It started off and it's still to this day is the, is the basic orange very matic. But each time I bring a new model out, that starts to, uh, uh, to get some traction. And I have to say our centenary watch has been the biggest seller so far this year. That's my new shape. Uh, rectangular watch to commemorate uh, the centenary of Prestex. And you sent us one across and it is fantastic. Actually, one of the listeners got in touch with me to say, has Scottish Watches ever thought of doing a collaboration watch? So there's something we might talk about for the future. Well, I'd very much welcome that conversation. Very much indeed, Ricky. That would be something I'd like to like like to do. There's lots of setup still to do. We are only halfway through the day, so we're going to let Neil get on with it and we'll catch up with you soon. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thank you. We are with somebody who I've met a number of times before. He's been on the show. He's a familiar noise, but he's also going to be invading your eyeballs today. It is Rich from Studio Underdog. How are you getting on? I'm good. Invading eyeballs. I think that's the that's the first intro. I'm being a little bit PG because this is a family event. There's going to be lots of kids here. We're here to talk about what you've been up to and the fact that you replenished your stock a couple of days ago and 3,000 pieces disappeared like that. Yeah, so we did a, a, a restock of... Well, the core series, the O1 series and the O2. It's the first time we've released both of those two alongside each other. And that, yeah, people clearly 
love a bit of color when it comes to, to watches and yeah, British watches. Um, so I think 3,000 people grabbed it in the first sort of 15 minutes or so with fulfilling, you know, first come first serve. So people wanted to get in there early, which is great to see. I still see the original, the OG, the watermelon sitting on eBay for over a thousand pounds. And we're now, what, nearly three years or thereabouts down the road? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a bit of a catch-22 situation, you know. As the demand increases, we're increasing our, you know, our output and our assembly capacity. We assemble each watch, you know, by hand. Admittedly, not myself. If it was me, it would be held together by blue tack. But every watch, you know, by hand here in the UK. So we're building that out. But as we build that out and grow that, the demand continues to increase as well, which is kind of what we experienced earlier this week. Of all the models, I love the OG. That's the one that I got for myself. Yeah. What is the most popular one? Has it remained? That has remained, yeah. That is the, uh, it reigns supreme. From the 01 series, looking at it, nearly 50% of the sales were to the watermelon. And I think overall, looking at both, you know, the 01 and 02, in, in totality, at least a third went to, uh, yeah, went to the watermelon. So that is our our staple, that is, that's our Royal Oak. I was going to say that, that is your Nautilus, that is your Royal Oak. And of the colorways, what is the kind of iterations end? What are the top three? So now that we've got eight products in the core range, the O1 and the O2 series, it's really clear to see what people want from the brand. So we've got a couple of watches that are a bit more tonal, a bit more traditional black or white dials. So I think the midnight and the full moon only together combined uh, worked out to be 7% of the total sales. The rest was everything colorful. So I think, yeah, the message has been, yeah, received loud and clear. People want color, people want fun uh, from Studio Underdog, which is to be expected. That is, that's an integral part. It's a pillar of the brand. It is, and how has O2 been the, the difficult second album? The difficult second album, yeah, it's been really, really well received. It, as you said, it was it's a challenge. How do you introduce something after the kind of success of the watermelon? But people really seem to, to understand it much more than I thought it would be understood from the outset. So for me, I knew the O2 series was the correct product for Studio Underdog. Whether that equated to demand or popularity, it didn't really matter to me because it was the right product to explain what the business was about. Actually, people seem to really love it. You know, the pink lemonade uh, in particular, that's the one that, yeah, people really seem to, you know, to be drawn towards. It's the most familiar when you look at watermelon. And I usually look at watch brands when they've released their first and then they bring out their second and you can see they fixed a lot of problems and perhaps there was a design flaw that they have remedied. But the watermelon still stands on its own. There is nothing wrong with it. It's not like you've bettered it. In fact, I think I prefer the original over the O2 series. Yeah. So it just shows how well you did it in the first place. Any murmurings of anything coming for O3? Interestingly, and sort of on that point as well, for the O1 series, for the watermelon, that has been our sort of centerpiece for three years. I think in two days time will mark the three year anniversary of, of Studio Underdog. So yeah, we're an infant in the grand scheme of, of horology, but that core range, you know, the, the watermelon, the mint choc chip, the goofy panda and the desert sky, those four have remained our core range pretty much from the outset. So we've not introduced or discontinued or, um, or changed that core range around too much. And I think that's a really important element of the business to really set us up for the long term. And by taking things slowly and not introducing too much too quickly, I think again, will set us up to mean Studio Underdog will be here for many years to come, which kind of then gets me to the point of, of answering your question. For the O3 series, it's gonna take a little bit more time. I think probably maybe towards the end of this year, possibly into next year before we look to, to launch something like that, um, because we really wanna let the O2 series and the O1 you know, have their time, you know, have their time in the limelight, really. And you don't want people doing the thing that perhaps some of the big houses like Grand Seiko do, where they, they've got great designs, but they've got too many. And people hold off this month because something better might come along next month. And there's that fear of missing out. You don't have that. The fear of missing out is if you're not within that 13 minute window to buy the new watches. But anything particular happening, Watchmakers Day, any specials that you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So we've done a, a limited edition, a special edition, much like a, a lot of the uh, the amazing brands that are here this weekend. So we've done a 25 piece limited edition um, based on uh, one of our O2 series, so our field watch. Um, 
slightly different from the ones uh, that, that we've currently got. It's sort of taking a really traditional vintage silhouette of this classic field watch, but then using modern materials. So we've got, you know, what typically people would see as aged patina. We've got vibrant orange hands, right, to sort of represent that aesthetic, but in a modern way. Always a pleasure to see you in real life instead of just a voice on a Zoom call and a recording. And I'm pretty sure they'll sell it pretty quick and we'll see you shortly on the show again. Yeah, thank you for having me. And we have got a returning guest to the show, somebody that probably hasn't been on video before, but you've been in audio a number of times. He's helped us out behind the scenes with lots of different things and he's here to celebrate a centenary. It's an anniversary, not just the first inaugural British Watchmakers Day, but 100 issues of Oracle Time. So how are things going, Tom? Yeah, going really well. This is a first for us, setting up at a show. So it's, uh, it's weird to be on the other side of things, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, 100 issues. It's been a crazy 10 years. First collaboration watch with, uh, with Christopher Ward to celebrate. So we've got lots of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's going pretty well. Well, pop quiz time. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite thing over the last 10 years? Honestly, appearing on the Scottish Watches podcast. No, I'm joking. You don't even rehearse this. Not even rehearse. Uh, no, I don't really know. I mean, to be honest, for me, it's been like a real journey of, of just learning, really, because I started it as a bit of a blagger, you know, in all honesty. You know, you have that imposter syndrome when you start. Um, so, yeah, just growing the team, employing young people, you know, watching them learn creating watches, creating cool content. You know, there's been so many highlights, I guess. Um, and it's, it's hard to just name one. I think the full journey. Good answer, okay, next question. If yeah. you could go back 10 years and teach yourself one important thing, what would that be? Really, really on the spot, but... Um, Tell us about your new limited edition watch. Yeah, is that yeah, just your sorry, question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, so here it is. I mean, you probably can't <laughs> see it in the in the in the camera, but we'll cut to one. Yeah, it's the it's the Christopher Ward C65 June Shore line. It's inspired by um, the, the movie British Coastline. No, it's not the movie, unfortunately. But it's um, yeah, it's obviously got this 3D hydraulic press printed dial, so lacquered dial, um, and it has a, a sort of wave ripple pattern. Limited to 100 pieces. It's available um, on priority access to our paying subscribers. So we're really just kind of adding value to our print subscribers, saying thank you if you like to some extent, although they still have to pay for the watch. It's not free, of course, but <laughs> saying thank you and just really adding some some extra value. And, and for us, I mean, this was a really cool project. I was just saying to you that it gives you sort of a glimpse of what it's like to, to sort of, you know, run a brand or launch a watch and, you know, creating the content and doing all the fun parts and letting Christopher Ward take, take, all take the, the heat. Yeah, take the heat. And, and they've got such a, a good team. Their designer, design team's great. Um, so it, it really was quite effortless for us, really. Do you want a little bit of a hint? You think you've given them the hard task yeah. you have, but you will still get emails from people when their deliveries don't turn up in time. Yeah. That's that's true. I'm 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 willing to I'm willing to take only take one for the yeah, team yeah, there. Exactly. But so what's the spec on this one? What's the size? Yeah. yeah so it's 38 mil steel case. Obviously, um, it's got chrono chronometer certified Cosk liter movement in it. 38 hour power reserve, four hertz. Um, it's got 150 meter water resistance. And and really for me, the watch that we wanted to create was like a daily a daily wear watch. We didn't want to create something that you sort of, you know, get out on the weekends. It's something that you would like quite a rugged watch. Um, yeah, and, and, and the subtle, it's got, you asked obviously about, does it have Oracle time on it? It does, it has it on the back. It's super subtle because I think realistically people buying this watch, they don't want Oracle time on, on the logo. You know, we're a media outlet first and foremost. So we wanted to keep it super subtle on the, on the case back. And um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it sells. <laughs> we'll see. It's, I think it will. Yeah, I, I really like it. It's got a really good color scheme. That yeah, I would even call it cyan. It's a kind of yeah. almost verging into aquamarine territory. Definitely. Just that gray color. Yeah. Just don't say Tiffany blue. Whatever you I do. I did not but, say yeah, that. No, I'm joking. I did but not it's say uh, that. Um, but yeah, you know, obviously we've got the. I've, I've even brought the hundredth issue to like showcase because, yeah, I mean, going back to what I would do after. Uh, the, you know, telling myself 10 years ago, just probably put myself out there more with the community and like, you know, meet more people. I was super insular when we started it. I thought, you know, we can just build it on our own internally. But I realized like more and more that 
the watch community is so reliant on on everyone. I'm glad you thought about that and came back to me. That's a sign of a true professional. So what is the? I'm not going to ask you what the decade ahead looks like because nobody knows. But what would you say your 2024 has got in store? Yeah, well, I think we're launching. Well, we're launching our membership, which is essentially our subscriber product transforming into a membership. So we're going to be adding and only fans. Yeah, basically, just uh, Sam Kessler. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll finish there. But <laughs> yeah, we uh, so we basically want to just you know keep the quality of the print magazine up, keep it authentic, um, keep it kind of as non pretentious as possible in terms of the content that we're producing and, and as and as focused as possible. But also we're going to be doing um, launching the membership, which will have. Uh, we're going to be offering discounts. We're going to have like a login section on our website. We're going to have brand experiences. We're going to have priority access to certain watches, more collaborations, all sorts of stuff in 2024. So it's 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 pretty exciting time. You know, it's daunting, but like yourself, you know, I'm sure you've got. Well, you're telling me you've got loads in store. So it's like one of those things. You once you get the ball rolling, it just. Uh, there's just so much to do. It snowballs quite yeah. quickly. Yeah. Oh, well, listen, there's loads to chat about. Yeah. We've got to drag you back on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. You've seen him before. You've heard him before multiple times. He was recounting the episode numbers that he has been on in the past. It sounded like Scottish Watch's bingo. We, of course, have got Nicholas Bowman Scarborough from the Fears Watch Company here today, British Watchmakers Day, and I can't think of a more British watch company. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm very proud that Fears was one of the founding members of the Alliance, which is the organisation that, of course, is putting on British Watchmakers Day. So for me to be in this room, seeing an event that we were speaking about when we first created the Alliance, it's just incredible. That was over four years ago now. It was. I mean, the first conversations were just before the pandemic really, really hit. And one of the things we wanted to do was go, actually, what if you had an event that focused just on the variety of British brands. So everything from where Fears was not that many years ago, one man bands, right through to the big boys like Christopher Ward and everyone in between. So it's so good to be here today and see us all coming together. If you can hear lots of noise in the background, it's because this is set up day, lots of stuff is happening. It is going to be chaos tomorrow. It'll be even louder, but we're going to go around. We're going to see what you've got on display because you've not actually showcased to me all the new stuff. I've not seen it yet. There's something hiding on the wrist. We did get the press release through of the new Fears models. And as I mentioned earlier on and on a prior show, I loved the one that's got the multiple striations on the minute track. It's not the usual affair from Fears, something that people didn't really expect. What has the perception been with the public? What have the comments and feedback been like on the new ones? I don't think we could have asked for a better launch. I mean, it, there was a lot of apprehension because Fears started in 2016 when I restarted the brand with a round watch called the Redcliffe. But very quickly, a year later, everyone became got to know the Brunswick model, our cushion case. And so when we were bringing the Redcliffe watch back, there was a bit of, a lot of people won't know what this is. They won't understand the link to our current heritage, you know, our recent, recent times. But what people have, and what I'm, I'm so grateful for, is they've seen that it's the Fears watch. It has all the Fears DNA, but it's the contemporary take of it, whereas the Brunswick is the more classical take. And so it's really nice to see that we have now completed the collection with both sides of our Fears design language. Did you not think of changing the name because it is such a distant departure from the prior one? There were a few thoughts whether we should and retire the Redcliffe collection and what it was originally. However, Redcliffe is named after Redcliffe Street in Bristol where my great, great, great grandfather first started Fears. And the Brunswick's named after Brunswick Square where Fears had their export department. So these names are very important, very intrinsically linked to the Fears heritage. Plus, I also own the trademarks for them. So I didn't want to have to re-trademark a, a third name. So for us, it was very important to say, actually Redcliffe is such an important name within the business. We couldn't just let it die and disappear. And what else is happening? I heard somebody talking about boutique. Yes, so in three weeks' time, we'll be opening our first standalone boutique in Bristol in the historic Victorian Clifton Arcade. And Clifton Arcade is in Clifton Village, which is basically the Bond Street of Bristol. And what's lovely about that is we've, we've still got our headquarters in Paintworks in the creative quarter. So we've now got a second premises, which means splitting the team, bringing on new members of the team to run it, manage it. But the great thing is, Whereas before everyone had to book an appointment, we're only open Monday to Friday. Now we'll be open at the weekend. It's a boutique. You can walk in off the street, come in, try on the collection, 
And if you choose to, purchase. Something that stuck out to me as I'm grabbing people as they're busy, as they're setting up, there's a gentleman waiting, just behind the camera, ready to go. The thing that's caught me is the growth. There will be people coming in here that maybe started a magazine 10 years ago, Tom at Oracle Time. We've had Rich from Studio Underdog talking about the O2 series. And there's this progression, a little bit like Scottish Watches that started for a bit of fun. Me sitting in my spare bedroom, dicking about with a microphone. I remember the pictures of you on your landing at the Mac. I think it was a second-hand MacBook yes, that you had bought. <laughs> and how things have just moved forward. And it's great for British watchmaking and watch collectors across the world because... A bit like ourselves and some of the other guys I've spoken to, America's a big market, Canada's a big market, Switzerland even. The thing I think when you talk about the growth is, yeah, seven and a half years ago, I'm working from a landing at home. We this week took on our 10th member of the team who's going to be managing the boutique. But the thing for me is where, as a small British watch brand, we're now hiring from. You know, our new boutique manager has left a job at Breguet on Bond Street one of our commercial team members has moved over from Tudor. And so for me, it's this sense of going, wow, after seven and a half years, people are going, actually, I'm going to leave a big Swiss brand and move to a relatively small, relatively unknown British brand. And that's not just fears. I know when talking to other brands, they're beginning to see that actually the cut through of being a British brand is actually having resonance with people and employment opportunities. Oh, it's fantastic to see and it'll be fantastic to see how well received the new watches and everything on your stand is tomorrow so nick thank you for joining me and we'll catch you again soon thank you very much thanks for being here and here we are with another great british watch brand that's helped us out dramatically over the years with press presses press releases keeping us up to date on what they've been doing including trying to blow up their watches I don't understand this. It's like most people want to try and sell watches. They don't want to destroy stock levels. But you guys have taken things out. You've moved it to the nth degree. And we've had you in the show a couple of times. You've been on maybe once before. We've had Ian on before. But it is Elliot Brown. What's happening? What's going on? Gosh, lots. Uh, so, uh, well, if, if, this is fantastic. The British Watchmakers Day. Really looking forward to... Uh, I think somebody's trying to break, break through. through it's like yeah. or it's really... <laughs> through really, really, <laughs> yeah, tell us what's been going on really looking forward to tomorrow so we uh, for tomorrow we're doing a uh, a unique uh, beach master it's called the fade um and we have the a red green inner bezel uh, and that's the uh, we're doing 20 models of that that's it so it's a one yeah. of 20. and what's the price point on this one uh, two five six five this is obviously something that you can get on the day this is going out afterwards so we should probably talk about other things that are in the collection recent news and perhaps things that have been on the drawing board for a while that you've got planned for the coming months. Uh, What's the summer looking like in 24? Uh, summer's looking very busy. We are launching our um, Holt and Automatic GMTs uh, in May. Uh, we have a, a slight taster of a 38 mil field watch coming later in the year, which um, I'll show you when we, uh, when we get the first uh, iterations of that done, but that will continue to launch over the course of next year as well. Um, we are uh, getting more stock of our Beachmaster uh, automatic in this uh, later in this year so that's good news because we sold out the first two tranches first one first day second one in a week so that's exciting news next year we are planning uh, our camford 2.0 so camford was our our first watch ever in 2013 uh, and we felt now was the appropriate moment to to revisit it so we're uh, decreasing that size uh, adding some features and benefits to it and uh, that'll be quite exciting working through that next this year for a launch next year. It's almost as if, and I've said this to other people today, the last year maybe was a little bit slow, but come 24, things have really ramped up. We're seeing a lot more diversity in the marketplace. A lot of different brands are really pushing forward. And the collectors are really biting into the UK market, the, the guys that are making watches here. Yeah, I think that's absolute, absolutely right, Ricky. I think that uh, what we're achieving and have achieved over the last 18 months has been pretty astounding for us. We, we sort of did a bit of a vault fast from, from being more of an outdoor marketed brand to definitely within the watch space. And that's made a, a massive difference to us. Uh, and we are launching in the US this year. So we are going to be at uh, Wind Up in Chicago in July and then uh, Wind Up in uh, October in New York. But I think we're going to have to get you back on to show because the last time, there wasn't enough time to go through everything that was happening. Yeah, yeah. You had uh, various different events. Obviously, you're here today, but you were at, I think it was the BQ Watch Show. They did a couple of them. They were successful. Yeah, we, uh, we had a tremendous go at the uh, uh, Watch Pro Salon as well. Um, we, we launched a, 
um, a, a version of our Holton GMT Auto. Um, it was when we did the design work, we looked at this, and it was a vapor hone case, vapor hone bracelet with a, uh, a white out full loom dial. And we were a bit uncertain whether this was going to be like the best watch we'd ever launched or, or the most Marmite. So we made the decision to launch it on the, at nine o'clock on the morning of the show and finish the uh, window of opportunity at five o'clock on the second day of the show. Uh, and honestly, if we'd sold 50 pieces, I'd have been happy. But we ended up selling 427 watches over the 36 hours. So uh, we were all slightly aghast. I never knew that. Yeah, Genuinely did not know that. You sent me across one to have a look at. Yeah. And I loved the fact it was full loom but it was a kind of pinky hue. It yeah, wasn't yes. the usual blue yeah. or the usual green. Yeah. So it did stand out. And the finishing on an Elliot Brown watch, if you've never seen one in hand, the pictures, the renders, the videos, don't do it justice. It is so well defined yeah, for the price point. Yeah. You guys really do stick at it. And I suppose it's the heritage of the guys behind the scenes having had a watch company in the past, yes, very yeah. successfully and taking that forward, taking that into what you're doing today. And the price is just incredible. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and we continue to do that. You know, we're, we're launching some great product this year, at great prices, and really proud of it. But the uh, with the whiteout, if you remember, I was on your show, and you asked me what I was wearing, and I couldn't quite show you because I'd actually got our first <laughs> sample on, so you were the first person to get a taster of what that was going to be. So uh... No, it was good seeing that. It was good getting it on the show later on. Yes. And we even included yes. it in the advent calibre that we put on YouTube and yes. Instagram, and people loved it. It's yeah, just I mean, a shame it was so limited. Yes, yeah, but you did the uh, the launch of it post post fa f the uh, the fade out, didn't you? Yeah, we uh, that was really good. I'm going to okay. let you get on. You okay. have many things to do, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Perfect. Thanks very much. It's that time to reintroduce somebody that's been on the show a number of times before. Good friend, good friend to the show. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, Don Cochran from Vertex Watches. Based in London, here in London. In your hometown, Absolutely. capital city. Absolutely, it's nice to be here. Yeah, oh, God, we've been chatting for so long. You were introduced to me through Dave, obviously. Yeah. You've known him a lot longer than me. And I remember recording the first episode, and we had to do it in the same house in different rooms. That was back in the yeah. dodgy days. But things have moved along, and you guys have obviously been doing great guns. I have seen you at Global Red Bar. I've seen you at various things. I've seen pictures of you across the globe at different watch yeah. shows. But we're here in Britain, and have you got anything you want to tell the listeners about today? So the nice thing for us here is that we're based in London. We're actually based about 10 minutes away in the car from here. So just in Mayfair, currently in Victoria, Pimlico. Um, we'll be uh, showing all our current range of watches, and we'll also be previewing uh, the M36, which is our new release, which is coming out in the summer. Do you just name them after motorways? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. That's uh, the model, model 36, 36 mil. Okay. That's Makes the, sense. That's the thing. Okay. And what's special about this one then? What, what um, so is it? What's special about this one is that it's the 80th anniversary of D-Day this year. Vertex produced watches for the British military that were used on D-Day. This watch is um, really a reissue of that watch, slightly modernized. So it's like it's halfway between an original Dirty Dozen watch and a small M100. So molded loom, um, but box crystal, all the best bits, you know, proper watch. Okay, and something a common theme when we're speaking to people today is the last year has seen a growth in popularity for British watches. How have you seen things develop? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because we don't do a lot of active marketing, but we've seen a massive surge in sales in the last six months, um, which we've been enjoying. And in fact, we're running out of stock quite quickly, which we're not enjoying because uh, that will be annoying for a bit. But it's been amazing the last, last six months. It's been really good. And what is the team at Vertex? Who's involved? Because you're the kind of forerunner, the front guy. Who's behind the scenes? Yeah, well, we've got a great team. We've got Hugo and Robin, who you'll see, and Rob, actually, who you'll see here tomorrow. Um, uh, Hugo and Robin work in the store with me in Mayfair. Um, Rob runs our Instagram. Uh, he's a great guy. A lot of people know him from talking to him on Instagram. I'm going to let you go. This is literally the last two minutes before you get a parking ticket outside. <laughs> I'll see, I'll so see we'll let you go. Now. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. Right, and brother. we need to get you back on the show yeah, at some we'll point. Show you, look forward to showing the watch. We've got a very welcome face. We've got a very welcome watch brand and a watch on the wrist. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience at home? Hi, everyone. I'm Matt from Bowcroft Watches. Uh, we're a micro brand based in Cambridge. You're no stranger to the show either in person, on video, or by sending watches across for us to have a look at. Most recently, The Seeker, it was on the show maybe a week ago, and we didn't get a chance to put it in the video. We did put it in the show notes. We have put the pictures online. 
But it seems like we just can't get rid of you. You know, you're always <laughs> popping up with new things. Always hanging around. It was the original watch, then it was the custom editions, and now it's this one. How has it been received in the marketplace? What has the feedback been like? Because I know what I'm going to tell you, you'll love. But what have the audience been into? What have they been telling you? What have customers been like? Has it been a good success so far? It's been really positive. I think it's... Um it's the first watch where we really start to play around with a lot more details, really explore color, and kind of bring out a bit more of our personality. And I think because we've done so many custom watches for a while, we started to hone in on you know what's exciting, what's a bit different, and kind of sharpen up some of those design details. So, And how did you come up with the idea of changing the outer track, the way it's almost mirroring mm -hmm. that Fumé style of the inner? Because that's a bit that caught me with the watch. Yes, I remember you mentioned that. I think... Um, we kind of fell in love with uh, Fume watches. Um, and when we were introducing another layer to the dial, we thought, well, what if you kind of do a Fume on the lower layer and then the top layer and kind of get it to really bloom out the watch? And by changing that finish as well, just get that extra bit of sparkle. How many prototypes and iterations does a new watch design take? It's something that I like to ask behind the scenes questions because we get asked all the time, what's it like? Some people get in touch to say, I want to start my own watch brand. How difficult is it? And we never put them off, but we do tell them that it is climbing a mountain. And it looks easy now, it's just like everything looks easy now, it's until you try it yourself. I think that's exactly it. I mean, the, the nice thing about like modern technology today is you can 3D print things really quickly. Then you, you know, we have a, a CNC machine locally that we get so the casework's made early, so we can start to really play and explore. But you're right, there's nothing beats getting it in the metal. And then it's, you've got to live with it for a while. So it's not just the time to design and prototype, it's how much risk time do you want to give it before you then say, yes, that's it, and that's ready to go. So we kind of make a few and then wear it, live with it for a while, send it out to different people, really just to get to know the watch before we're 100% happy with it. And when you were on the show the last time, we were talking about the fact you've done watches for famous people. How's that come along? Who's the latest and greatest yeah, to wear one of your watches on the rent? <laughs> I think the last watch we did was was for your good lady. It was for Simona. It was the last one that we've fully finished and got on her got on her wrist. So maybe people that have been on the stage, been in the charts, sure. been on them, the mix them as well, screen. of course. Yeah. So we um, we work with a music festival and we designed watches from every anyone from. Lionel Richie, um, Grace Jones, and uh, to Denise Van Outen. So full, a full range. That is there. indeed a wide <laughs> gamut and a full spectrum of yes. different people. And what you're showcasing today, what is the latest one? Yes, so our latest and the, the one we were super excited about to launch uh, at the show is called the British Sky. So it's a special edition 25-piece um, seeker. We sat down with Alistair and Catcher to design it in Cambridge over quite a few gins. So she and finally came down. She finally came Brilliant. down. Yeah, absolutely. And we thought, what's the most British thing? What's the thing we all talk about, moan about? It's the sky, it's the weather. So the British sky is, is based on kind of the best we could hope for from a British sky. It's slightly cloudy. It's got steely greys. It's a Fumé dial blending to a, that kind of blue sky that we all hope for being Brits. Now and How many again, are you doing? How much 25. is it? 25. Uh, doing 25 pieces and they're 450 pounds. I think they'll all be gone by the time, definitely all be gone by the time this hits the airwaves. Sounds great. Speak to you Thank soon. Thank you. Cheers. Time for another victim, and it's probably the last victim of the day because the camera batteries are running low and my attention span is starting to drift because I've not had any caffeine for a little while. But we have a new person to talk to, somebody that's been on the show once before. Introduce yourself to the clicking camera that is behind the scenes getting some well, I feel like BTS I feel caught. like I'm being papped here but uh, yes. my name is Oliver I'm the uh, brand manager for Accurus watches so very excited to be here very excited to be talking to you again it's been you know about six months since the the podcast went out when I had my little 15 minutes of fame yeah it was an episode that we've had a lot of response from because it tickled the nostalgia that we talk about the Argos catalog we talk about the adverts on TV yes and uh, yeah people really resonated and the thing was you're not an old gentleman you weren't there as a founder, a, no. a brand ambassador back in the day. Like you were talking about the Beatles, you were talking about John Cleese, the adverts. Yes, yeah. You had such a good knowledge of what has happened before, but you're relatively new to the world. So how did you manage to take yourself back in time and become so steeped in all the entrenched in all the history of the brand? How does this work? Well, I, th I think it's one of those things when you've got a passion for it, it's, it's something that kind of I really believe in. I think brands that have history kind of really resonates. And I think brands that have history that are accessible, like Accurist, kind of particularly appeal to me. So when it came time to kind of revitalize the brand, which we did for our 75th anniversary, it really was about diving deep into the archives 
looking at what made Accurist kind of stand out in, in its day. And kind of the more you dig, the more you find. So it was kind of digging through archives of old newspapers, finding the original adverts, looking at those old TV adverts, but then also speaking to, you know, kind of very kind of unscientific data, but talking to my dad, my granddad, just people that you know, and everyone has a story about Accurist, whether that's the talking clock, whether that's the John Cleese adverts, whether that's just that they bought one when they were 18 and it, you know, it served them well. So it was a very fun brand to dig into. And, you know, then we got to bring it to life in the, the new collections that we launched kind of over 18 months ago now. And you've got a whole new load of colorways. I don't know if they're specific for Watchmakers Day or you just happen to coincide the launch date with what's happening here. But we put them in our Instagram. Immediately, the comment section lit up with people going, and I think accurate, I think of the talking clock. So there's something that is stuck in people's mind for decades. And then the other comments were very happy that there was new colorways coming out because the original ones you launched with last year, they were vintage, they were 70s. Yeah. Now you've got these vibrant colors. Yeah, well, kind of part of our full revitalization, we changed everything. We went back to a 1960s logo, but we also got new brand colors. And the, the four colorways that you see in the, in the dials are our four brand colors. So we've got bright orange, light teal, dark teal, and a mushroom, which is just off silver. So we did specifically design those for British Watchmakers Day. They are launching here tomorrow, kind of exclusively. Uh, they will then be available, what's left of them, on our website from the 1st of April. But, you know, they were designed specifically. And we, yes, you're right. We went, right, we've got the classic colors. We've got the 1970s style down. Let's really kind of make these pop now. And kind of, we call them the bold new colors because they really are a departure from the last launch that we did. And what's the feedback been like since you brought back things last year? Have the public gone wild for it as we imagined? Do you know what? I, I, there's been two waves. So kind of, there's been the relaunch of the brand as a whole. And, you know, we are a very consumer-focused brand. You know, we want people to have as many accuracies on their wrist as possible. So that was great for the first wave. But then six months ago, or kind of maybe nine months ago, when we spoke last, we introduced the automatics. And that's where, what people were crying out for, because we're used to producing watches between 100 to 200 pounds. But from kind of all the history, from the feedback that we got, people wanted to buy into our brand, but they wanted that mechanical nature to it. So since we launched, kind of it started with uh, 10 watches. We've now got more in our collection, ladies, gents, dive, these new limited editions. That's kind of increased our range even more. Well, that's fantastic. And we're going to have to bring you back on the show maybe in another six months time for an annual roundup. But I'm looking forward to seeing these new watches. I've not seen them yet, seen the pictures. I'm looking forward to that tomorrow and all the best of luck with it. Yeah, thank you very much. And you know, I'll see you tomorrow. So that wraps up the show. Be sure to check out the show notes on the website. The link will be in the description. And the next episode is where me and Dave discuss exactly what happened at the show. It was a brilliant event and you'll want to check that one out. So listen in on Monday for that one. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you guys again soon.